most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so very much for this high Sabbath that we're having, Lord, and for all the knowledge that you're putting before each of us here, Lord. Father, we just ask your Holy Spirit to continue to abide with us here, Lord, and where you say in Matthew 18, Lord, that when two or three are gathered together, Lord, we just ask the presence of Jesus here. Father, we just ask you to bless Jeff in this next presentation. And Father, we just thank you for this uh, Sabbath day as it draws to a close. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I um, have a friend of mine here. I have many friends of mine here. But I have a friend of mine here that uh, we haven't been around for probably seven years or so. But he was around when we first had opportunity to uh, begin sharing prophecy. And early on this week, he says, are you going to do the prophetic pattern? He says, he started telling me all the reasons that was one of his favorite um, presentations. And I need to do that right away. If I did that right from the start, it would be easier to understand all this. And uh, I says, I have it planned for the end. And, uh, but as, as he was expressing, this uh, is one of uh, my favorite studies also. And it, from my understanding, there's a great deal of light in this and I know from or I believe from my experience that there's areas of this study that I've never had time to dive into that have to have even more light that I've even come close to searching. So we're going to look at the prophetic pattern. Um, prophetic pr pattern is a series that's available um, in, through our ministry in uh, eight parts, so you can spend eight hours on it easy enough and not even scrape the surface. We're not going to take that long on it. But when you have to go out and speak and you want to establish this pattern very quickly and you do it in a very simplified fashion, uh, more simplified than we're going to do here, we call it the 3-1 pattern. And uh, it's, it's like the beast, dragon, and false prophet. It runs from the beginning of the Bible to the end, but it's even illustrated from my study more often than even the threefold makeup of modern Babylon. And it represents the three angels' messages that came into history in the Millerite time period and the fourth angel's message that ri ri arrives in the history that we're living in now. So we're going to look at some of these. Um, and I always have to say, um, the first couple, they sound kind of a weak argument. But one place we can see the 3-1 pattern um, is illustrated is in Noah and his three sons. Uh, and by, uh, the ancient prophets were speaking more about the end of the world and the days in which they lived. So I'm suggesting that these um, histories that we're going to see this pattern illustrated in are um, illustrating the end of the world. And therefore, um, they're illustrating the three angels' message and the fourth angels' message at the end of time. And, uh, but as we've been suggesting all the way through, the different places that we find um, prophetic lines of history that are to be brought down to the end of the world, if, if they're the same line of history, such as the beast, dragon, and false prophet, which we have some of the times that the beast, dragon, and false prophet are illustrated in history. By the way, uh, there are others, other passages of Bible history that have the threefold enemy of the beast, dragon, and false prophet represented in that we haven't dealt with this week. That's, that's the ones that we needed to deal with that seemed appropriate to make some points. But as we pointed out in that study, just to remind you, the, beast, the story of the beast, dragon, and false prophet in Revelation 16 is how modern Babylon, this threefold enemy of God, leads the world to Armageddon, whereas the threefold enemies at the cross is describing the role of Babylon in the sense this is all of mankind um, that Christ is reconciling to himself at the cross. Uh, Sister White, when she talks about this threefold union, um, it's Catholicism, spiritualism, and apostate Protestantism. She's not talking about how they lead the world to Armageddon. She's giving their spiritual characteristics there. And in Numbers 22, in Nehemiah, we have uh, two testimonies about how modern Babylon attacks modern Israel. And then in Daniel 11.41 and Isaiah 11.14, we have the story not of how modern Babylon leads the world to Armageddon, but it's an illustration of those that come out of Babylon during the loud cry message. And in the two Elijahs, Elijah and John the Baptist, we get some of the primary characteristics 
um, the, of modern Babylon, the impure woman, the civil power, and the deceiving power. And then when we look at the threefold power in the seat, authority, and power that was given to the papacy by pagan Rome, we begin to get these histories of the year 330, 533, 40, 496 to 508, and we also get the distinction of what these threefold powers represent. Um, the beast, Catholicism, is the one that is seated, seating, the one that is setting on the throne. Uh, the authority, civil authority, uh, the action of a legislative and judicial branch is authorities, and power in Bible prophecy, military power. So we realize the false prophet is the one with the military power, the dragon power, the civil structure, the impure woman, the impure church. And it's the same way with the 3-1 combination. When you look at Noah and his three sons, and uh, Abraham and the three heavenly visitors that came to visit him just before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, that story seems to be suggesting the condition of the world. Job and his three friends, um, suggesting the, the experience of God's people here at the end of the world. Christ and the three disciples at the Mount of Transfiguration, giving us a, a picture of the return of Christ and the redeemed of both the living and the dead um, at that time. Balaam's three best blessings followed by a fourth. A Gideon and his 300, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the same 3-1 combination, only they bring different um, pieces of information down to the time period of the three, at the end of the world, three angels' messages and the fourth angel's message. So we're suggesting uh, Matthew 24, 38 through 39, that in the story of Noah, we see the condition of the world just before the end. Um, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah and, to, entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. If this was the only illustration of the three angels' message followed by the fourth, it'd be too weak, weak to consider. But when uh, I was kidnapped down in Columbia this year, and they, they didn't just take all my clothes and all my money, they took the notes I went down there to do the prophecy school on, so we had to do the Columbian prophecy school straight from the Bible, which is good enough, but we, we prepared... Uh, this study uh, on PowerPoint because we were doing that and I think we dug out about 23 one combinations when we got to this point out of the Bible Um, and we we didn't get them all so we're just looking at some of them. Noah and his three sons are one of them. Uh, Abraham and his three heavenly visitors. Um, Abraham and his three heavenly visitors is giving us the uh, the idea of the condition of the world um, during as symbolized by Sodom and Gomorrah but it's also emphasizing judgment Um, Because if you remembered the story of the three visitors coming to Abraham, Abraham brought this uh, question up to the Lord. Uh, Genesis 18, verses 25, 26, 33, a piece of it. You know the discussion they had, but we'll read a part of it. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. Judgment. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said... If I find in Sodom and Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned into his place. One of the stories that Abraham in the 3-1 combination brings with us is not only the condition of the world, but that the 3-1 combination takes place in the time of the judgment. Job and his three friends, the experience of God's people. At this time period in earth's history, we know that we're going to reach a point, if we're faithful, where every earthly support will be cut off. And not only will every earthly support be cut off, we're going to be in a time when the whole world is being turned upside down by the judgments of God. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschews evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear not God? Job and his three friends. Christ and the three disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you haven't read closely the Gospels here recently, when you do go back and read through them again, um, take note that when Christ um, took a, a selected group of disciples aside instead of the twelve, it was almost always four. But in the Mount of Transfiguration, he took three with him. 
3-1 combination. And in that um, experience is when Elias and Moses came and talked with him. Matthew 17, 1 through 3. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses, Elias, talking with him. Um, this, it's in the time period of the third angel and fourth angel's message that we should expect to see the second coming of Christ. Uh, if you remember the story of Balaam, um, he pronounced three cursings. And then what happened to King Balak, the man that had hired Balaam to come and curse Israel? What, what, what does inspiration say after the third blessing went forth? What did Balak do? It says he was disappointed and he sent Balaam home. Note that, that King Balak was disappointment after the third message because as you begin to pull these three one combinations together, the characteristics of the three one combinations begins to build up the story of the great disappointment, October 22nd, 1844, that came after the third message. And of course, we know that before Balaam went home, as Balak told him to do, he stopped and on his own initiative, he pronounced a fourth blessing. And uh, for me, I, you know, I can't be certain about what these histories mean. I have to put them in my own words. And for me, uh, what the story of Balaam is suggesting is that the three angels' message is either a blessing or a curse, depending on how we receive it. Gideon is 300. One of, from, from my studies, this is one of the most complete um, and con pictures of Adventism in the Word of God. The story of Gideon has virtually every feature that we understand the Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, it, within the story of Gideon, you'll see the 3-1 combination more than once, but we know that it was Gideon and the 300 um, that brought the final warning message to the world. And how did they bring the final warning message to the world? They put a torch in a clay pot and they broke it and they shouted out uh, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And the sword is the word, the word of the Lord and Gideon. Uh, the clay pots is our earthen vessels that need to be crucified on the cross of Christ. And when they are crucified on the cross of Christ, the glory of the Lord is symbolized in the flaming fire, shines up, shines out. And that is the third angel's message. And Gideon the 300 represents the righteousness of, of Christ um, that is the final warning message that he symbolizes. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into the flaming fire, and then the fourth appears, 3-1 combination. And I would submit to you, though, although, you know, you can't, I can't really point you into this passage. Um, Seventh-day Adventists, as much as we know the story of Daniel, as much as we deal with that, uh, we know that Nebuchadnezzar, he was fond of Daniel, and there's no reason not to think that he didn't know who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. They were Daniel's friends. They were, they were there of all. And I just, I have a hunch the reason that they got the second chance. Remember, they got a second chance. He didn't throw them directly into the fire, which may be identifying a Sunday law in the United States and a world Sunday law, but I'm not trying to make that point. There was a, you got, they got two tests. But the point I'm trying to make is I think he liked them enough that when he realized they were the ones that didn't bow down, he was disappointed and gave him a second chance. But I don't have a proof text for that, but I just look at all the other evidence and it, it fits, it fits. And then the fourth appeared. In this story, I believe it's representing how the message is carried. It's telling us how the final warning message is carried because all the world was there at the, at the test of um, Nebuchadnezzar's image and they all watched as Seventh-day Adventism was thrown into the testing fire and what the world seen was those three, but what they really seen was that fourth that was there with them, and that's Christ coming down in Revelation 18 and standing with his people during this testing time. That's the three one, how the, the third angel's message is carried. Daniel and the three wor worthies. Um, Daniel chapter one. What is the strength of the third angel's message? There it is in Daniel chapter one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel... Um, stand firm on the health message. R the very foundation of the book of Daniel is the health message, and that is the strength, the right arm of the third angel's message. And there it is in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel in the three worthies, in Daniel chapter 2. Suddenly, 
Uh, there's a commandment of the king to destroy all the wise men. Who are the wise at the end of the world that are going to be destroyed, that the king's going to try to destroy? Is it not the wise virgins? So what in that crisis time did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel do in that crisis? They sought the Lord in prayer. The strength of God's people that proclaimed the three angels' message is going to be obtained by prayer. So if you put these lessons together, and there are others, there are others. This is just an example of how you can bring this combination down to the end of the world and begin to build a picture about what the 3-1 combination represents when you bring the different prophetic lines together at the end of the world. And these are the ones, uh, the, the summarizations of just those that we've selected. And uh, here is... Um, some definitions for those. The condition of the world, corruption. Judgment, the day of atonement. Every earthly support come, on, come off. And I, and I just have a hunch that that imminent is spelled wrong. Is it? The second coming? Yes. Yeah, pretty wrong. So we'll note that. I, I, there's, that is not the only word in here that I've spelled wrong, but it sure stood out when I looked at it. Um, the messages of day of decision, blessing and cursing, the righteousness of Christ, we see the 144,000. How the message is carried? It's carried in a day of severe crisis. The health message is the strength of the people. Prayer is the power of the people. So if you just take the, these three one combinations alone, and there are other, and you would bring them together, as Louis Weir often does with words in the Bible prophecy, and string them into a paragraph, this is what they would be teaching us. The three angels' message swell into a li the loud cry of the fourth angel's message in a time of great corruption in the final scenes of the Day of Atonement. At that time, every earthly support w will be withdrawn as the second coming of Christ draws closer. These messages are either a blessing or a cursing, depending on how we receive them. Received correctly, men will receive the righteousness of Christ to clothe them. Thus clothed, they will proclaim the final morning message in a time of severe crisis and their adherence to the health message will provide the physical strength necessary for that time and their adherence to prayer will provide them with the spiritual power for that time. And that's how a simple little combination like 3-1 brought down to the end of the world, line upon line, begins to develop the whole story of the three angels' messages. It, how I understand it. That's why, or the, one of the reasons why, in counsels to writers and editors, Sister White emphasizes the location of the messages. The proclamations of the first, second, and third angels' messages have been located by the word of inspiration. Not a peg or pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages than to substitute the New Testament for the Old. Inspiration is very specific that we need to mark the location that these messages came into history. First and second angels' messages were given in 1843. Notice, though, were given. Um, we've already read the quotes that the first angels' message came into history on 1840. Here she's just speaking about them being given in 1843. If you've been listening this week, the first angels' message was given this week. Okay? We, we've talked about enough that I think we can qualify as saying that. And we are now under the proclamation of the third, but all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for the truth. By pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation. And as we sound this proclamation, what are we supposed to show? Showing their order and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without the first and second. So she's emphasizing the, their particular place uh, and retaining all three. These messages we are to give the world in publications and discourses showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. And what I mean by that, what I understand by that and what I have come to realize you can do by that, and uh, let me put this up here, very simple, is she's saying that in 1840, the first angel's message comes into history. 1842. What have I been using? Haven't I been using blue? I, I, can't, I can't hear you. The white blue? The white blue? 
I stand corrected. That makes better sense to me. And, the, and this is eight, August 22nd, 1844. So they've been located in history, and there's a specific sequence, and we are waiting for the fourth angel's message to arrive in history at some point in the very near future. And what I've come, un come to understand, and, and we've been dealing with it here all week long, that if we are consistent and true with this history here, then we can fulfill that last sentence. We can show in the line of prophetic history the things that have been, these things, and by showing the things that have been, then we can show the things that will be. That's, that's the reason of being very strict about the location of the first, second, and third angel's message. And this quote here to me is very important. If you, and I think we may have read this here, but we're going to read it again. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 114. Prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line. The more for firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, the more clearly shall we understand the prophecy of Daniel, for revelation is the supplement of Dan Daniel. Now, I always stop here, and I try to explain this. I don't know if, if I have success, but I, I think I may have given this explanation here already, but I'm going to give it again because for me, this is important for me to understand, and hopefully it will be for you too. She's speaking here about standing under the banner of the third angel's message. And... We can take the, the, the third angel's message, fear God, give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens and the seas and the earth and the things that are therein. And, and we can take the first angel's message and give a sermon on it and take it apart piece by piece and give a powerful and correct and truthful and important presentation on what that giving glory to God means and the fact that judgment opened. That's, that's a way to deal with the first angel's message. Then we could take the second angel's message, uh, Babylon has fallen, and, and take it apart piece by piece. We can talk about what it meant that the churches fell in 1842, or we can take it to the, to the depth, of the spiritual depth of what Babylon really represents and how mankind is part of Babylon in the fallen condition. We can go a lot of ways with it. We can define the theology of the three angels' messages on every level and be correct. It's a way to present the three angels' message in a correct way. But what I'm seeing here in this quote is Sister White is talking about that there is a way to stand under the three angels' messages and use it as a tool to understand prophecy. So she's making a different um, application than the, the theological truths, which I'm not trying to downplay, um, that are worth understanding. Notice the next paragraph. The more fully we accept the light presented by the Holy Spirit through the consecrated servants of God, the deeper and surer, even as the eternal throne, will appear the truths of ancient prophecy. She's not talking here about uh, do uh, the doctrines of uh, uh, the sanctuary or theology. She's talking about the third angel's message in some way, somehow, being a banner that allows us to understand the truths of ancient prophecy. You see my point? Even if you don't believe it, you see the, the logic that I'm using here. The three angels' message, the banner of the three angels' message, there's some way, some way that we can use this to make prophecy um, more clear. Even as the eternal throne will appear the truths of ancient prophecy, we shall be assured that men of God spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Must, men must themselves be under the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Spirit, Spirit's utterances through the prophets. These messages were given not for those that uttered the prophecies, but for us who are living amid the scenes of their fulfillment. And I would suggest to you that when you correctly set forth the banner of the three angels' messages, and I would suggest also that the banner of the three angels' messages is including the fourth angel's message, it's this 3-1 combination, and the reason I call it a 3-1 combination is because that's the way it's portrayed in, in the Bible, and it's also um, 
the reality of it. Those three messages came into history and then there's been a long period of time that we've been waiting on the fourth angel's message. Longer than it needed to be. So, as you bring the different places in Scripture together where you see this 3-1 combination, you begin to develop characteristics for each of these messages. We've already touched on one. Uh, we'll suggest to you that as you bring them together, that after the third message, not every time, but many times, you will see illustrated a disappointment. We're going to attempt to show you these characteristics because they are important. The first one that we will deal with, uh, we're going to give Glenn some work this time, is that before a first message, this is the first message, we're going to define what a first message is, but before one, you'll see a period of darkness illustrated. Darkness precedes a first message. Early writings, page 229. He, William Miller, could see hypocrisy, darkness, and death everywhere. His spirit was stirred within. God called him to leave his farm as he called Elisha to leave his oxen and the field of his labor to follow Elijah. With trembling, William Miller began to unfold to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God, carrying his hearers down through the prophecies to the second advent of Christ. With effort, he gained strength. As John the Baptist heralded the first advent of Jesus and prepared the way for his coming, so William Miller and those who joined with him proclaimed the second advent of the Son of God. Two things in there. Darkness comes before William Miller, the, the messenger of the first angel. And notice also that Sister White compares William Miller with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, William Miller, the, Elijah... Um, the characteristics that are established as you bring these three one combinations together, and the one we're looking at now is the one that came into history in the Millerite time period. The characteristics of the first angel's message is that it is a message of reform. William Miller is a reformer, and over and over again, Sister White compares him with a reformer. Notice the next quote, early writings 2.33. Thousands were led to embrace the truth preached by William Miller, and servants of God were raised up in the spirit and power of Elijah to proclaim the message. Like John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the first message is a message of reform. Now, the second message is different. It's a message that, and by the way, there may be better names to hang on these messages, but I call it a message of revival. There may be a better way to express it. Choose your own. But the reason that I call the second angel's message a message of revival is when you see it illustrated um, in biblical history many times, not all times, and what I mean like that, you don't see these characteristics at all with Noah and his three sons. But the places where it il is illustrated, where there is a broader illustration of characteristics, the second angel's message you'll find in it at some point some kind of mighty movement of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, this is the latter rain falling, a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit. Notice this quote. This is talking about the second angel's message. Great Controversy, 399. Like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land from city to city, from village to village, and into remote country places it went until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. Dropping down to the red, it was similar in character to those seasons of humiliation and returning unto the Lord, which among ancient Israel followed messages of reproof from his ser servants. It bore the characteristics that marked the work of God in every age. Not only does she tell us that the second angel's message is uh, of a revival time period, she says it follows a message of reproof, reform, and that it's like it's as has been illustrated throughout um, sacred history. And it has been over and over again. The third message is what we call judgment. Um, you'll see why as we go on. The third message is a judgment message. And of course, this October 22nd, 1844, the opening of the judgment, Great Controversy 355, the prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening 
of the de judgment, and then she goes on to explain 1844, even though the date isn't in that quote. We know that judgment began on October 22nd, 1844. After the judgment, invariably, many times you'll find a disappointment. Sister White here is comp comparing the disappointment on October 23rd, 1844, with the disciples' disappointment immediately after the cross. And you notice, if you start looking for this, um, that the way Sister White portrays uh, the, the history of the three angels' message, arriving in history, she goes back into biblical history and gets history. She pulls history. She does, just, just doesn't give a rote explanation. She just reaches out into biblical history to portray it because she's wanting us to draw the connection between those histories that have also illustrated this pattern, the banner of the three angels' message, which we, if, if we stand beneath, um, the ancient truths of prophecy will come to light. Now, after a disappointment, you find a work given to the people of God. And then after that, just while I'm here at the board, you find the next characteristic is not black sliding, backsliding. Backsliding. So we're going to look for disappointment, a work given to the people of God, and then backsliding coming in to the people of God. And this is from Testimonies, Volume 6. And uh, I cannot str too strongly urge all our church members, all who are true missionaries, all who believe the third angel's message, all who turn their feet away from the Sabbath to consider the message of the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Um, the work of beneficence enjoined in this chapter is the work that God requires his people to do at this time. And then she drops down and begins to talk about uh, those that, are the, that build up the old places uh, and raise up the foundations of many ge generations. And she uses this passage in Isaiah many times to describe the work for the people of God. Continuing on, God's memorial, the seventh-day Sabbath, the sign of his work in creating the world, has been displaced by the man of sin. God's people have a special work to do in repairing the breach. Um, so there's a, always a work portrayed. Not always. Many times there's a work portrayed. But the sequence that is developed will identify that the pattern we're dealing with, darkness, a message of reform, followed by a message of revival with a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit, concluding in judgment, disappointment, a work given to the people of God, followed by backsliding, Evangelism 695 had Adventists after the great disappointment in 1844 held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world. They would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered, and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. So that, that's a good quote for a lot of reasons. Let's step out of this just for a minute, just for a minute. This, well, we've referred ahead to this quote all week long. She's basically saying, um, that in the 1844 time period, if, every would have, if the 50,000 would have been united and all entered into the most holy place and grew up into the message fully and surrendered themselves, that shortly thereafter the Lord would have come. Is that not what she's saying? Um, what about what we're saying about uh, the United Nations? The United Nations was over 100 years away. What about uh, what we're saying about... Uh, 1840, the Turkish, uh, Turkey gives its kingdom away to the European powers and um, it's divided up in 1918 time period. Well, what about the reality of the position of the papacy in the 1840s? I mean, you're not going to find a lower position of power for the papacy than, than the very time period that the book The Great Controversy was written. I mean, Sister White, when she was talking about the papacy taking control of the world, the papacy had never reached such a low point in history, but Sister White is saying in this quote 
that if God's people would have followed on unitedly, somehow the United States would have suddenly had the military strength to force the whole world to worship the papacy who is at its lowest point ever. And we have to consider this truth about Bible prophecy, that even though there are, the prophecy is conditional, but also God is all-knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows um, what's going to take place with his people. And the characteristic of the fourth angel's message is that it is the same as the second message. It is a revival message. You can see that in the scripture. Both the second and the fourth angel's message are Babylon is fallen. And so that's the characteristics of the three-one combination. Um, better check my notes. Uh, we want to add to this that in the second and fourth angel's message, there is a message that joins it. We have read this quote once today and looked at it twice. The part that is bold says, this message seemed to be an addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message. So right in here, the second angel's message gets joined by the midnight cry. This message, at some point in time, joins this message. That's one of the characteristics of the second and fourth angel's message, the joining. The second and fourth angel's message are cleansing messages. Selected message in book two, page 118. We have, we have read this quote probably four times in here. I'll read it one more time, part of it. It says, when Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So in the last work for warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. Then she quotes the second and the fourth angel's message. The second angel's message and the fourth angel's message are types of the two times when Christ cleansed the temple. The second angel's message reaches its climax on October 22nd, um, 1844, when Christ cleansed the temple, the spiritual temple of Adventism the first time, and the movement went from 50,000 down to 50 overnight. He cleanses the temple the second time at the Sunday Law when the greatest majority of Seventh-day Adventists received the mark of the beast and a small minority received the seal of God. The second angel's message and the fourth angel's message are cleansing messages that parallel the two times when Christ cleansed the literal temple. They are purifying messages. Same, we've read this quote a couple times. He will purify his church even as he purified the temple at the beginning and closed of his ministry on earth. Christ is going to purify his church. Getting out of the church because you think it's in a corrupted condition takes you to a place outside of the church where you're not around when it does get purified. And we want to be around when it gets purified. Amen. The... the the fulfillment of the second angel's message and the fourth angel's message are fulfillments of the parable of the ten virgins. We've read this one several times. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. You develop a lot of foundation as you go through the week. I know there's a one... There's only a few of you here that haven't been here all week, but these quotes we're going through we've looked at all week long, so uh, we're familiar with them. Russell's dealt with this one almost every day. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. Now, this time period, glorious manifestation of the power of God, repeated at the, the end. Confirming the pattern. Let's go look at another place in history where this pattern is established. Before we do, um, let me show you this pattern on another, another prophetic timeline. We're waiting for the fourth angel's message. The three angel's messages came into history. Uh, the third angel's here, 1844. 
What started this time prophecy of 2300 days? So it started on the third decree. And what, was the, what were these decrees? They were the decrees to come out of Babylon. And what was the work that the people of God took up at that time? And who is the man that symbolized the finishing of that work? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. And when Nehemiah came back to finish the work, what did he do before he came back? He secured a fourth decree. And we've read a passage um, earlier on. We'll probably read it again. It's real pertinent to this study. Sister White compares the first, second, and third angel's messages to three tests that took place in the days of Christ. The first test was John the Baptist, the second, the triumphal entry, the third, the cross, if you look at all the information available. And uh, what followed the cross in terms of this pattern? Pentecost? Pentecost. Pentecost is what points forward to the latter rain. So, what I'm suggesting to you, rightly understood, this 3-1 combination, you can find it three places in the 2300-day prophecy. And what I'm suggesting to you, if someone's going to teach you something, you have the responsibility to test it by the Word of God. And if it's erroneous, you need to reject it. And if they're teaching you something that's the very foundation of Seventh-day Adventism, then you need to really put your uh, thinking caps on. And what I'm suggesting to you here is I'm saying something not only about the three angels' message, which is the foundation of Adventism, I'm saying something here about the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14. So this is something uh, that you need to really um, nail down and make sure uh, that what you're hearing here is valid. Let's walk through this um, very briefly. There's a statement which, we'll, which we are going to read in our closing presentation on this. I think we can get to, through these on two. That Ezra the prophet, Ezra the prophet, after the third decree, when the people came out of Babylon to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, do you know what Sister White says um, Ezra, Ezra was? He was disappointed according to the spirit of prophecy right here. Um, were they given a work? Yes, they were given a work to do right here. What was it? Rebuild and restore the walls of Jerusalem? Why didn't they do it? Because they went into a backslidden state, correct? Um, now, in, in these three decrees, you do not, I do not know of any indication why you can call this first decree a reform message. These are just decrees, and that's the way prophecy is. The, the way marks are there, but this one doesn't have the specific information. But if you look very closely at the second decree, both in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, when Sister White addresses the second decree from the Bible, when the second decree is identified in the Bible, what phrase do you think is associated with that second decree in the Bible? Brother Robert, you probably know. It's out of Babylon with the second decree. Out of Babylon is associated with it in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. What's, what's that got to do anything with it? anything? The second angel's message, the call out of Babylon. Now the third angel's message, third decree, not a great deal connected to it to show that this is a judgment message, except, and that's what I always said, you don't see anything in these three decrees except for the out of Babylon in the Bible. Nothing in the first and nothing in the third. And then when I was sharing this one time in Malaysia, after I shared it, Brother Robert came up and he says, you know what? The third decree is the starting point of the 2300-day prophecy. Therefore, the third decree is the starting point for the prophecy that identifies that the judgment is going to begin. So the third decree really is connected to the judgment. So you have judgment illustrated here. The first decree is a reform message, and Sister White just, we've already read, who'd she compare William Miller to? John the Baptist. Here's a reform, reform message. Um, if you look closely at the information, the second, angel, the second message in Jesus' day, Sister White uses the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, 
and we have all these quotes. I'm just walking through it. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem where he told um, the Pharisees that if the children quit crying out, the very stones would cry out. Had no one accompanied Jesus into Jerusalem, the very stones would have cried out. It was a, it was a movement of the Holy Spirit. Second angel's message. Um, and then, of course, the, th the third way mark in the story of Christ is the cross, which is a judgment message. And then the fourth uh, parallels the second, a mighty um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we call Pentecost, which Pentecost illustrates the latter rain and the midnight cry time period of 1844. Um, what took place immediately after the cross? Disappointment. Uh, the Christian church was given a work to do, and although it's not very specific, it's not a, it's not a big illustration of backsliding, it's, 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 it, but it's there. And what took place before Pentecost? What had to happen before the Holy Spirit was poured out? The disciples had to put away their disagreements, which means there was some disagreements. There was, there was, was not unity. That had to be resolved very weak. I realize that, but it is there. And then we have the latter rain. Uh, they went fishing. Before Pentecost? When it, bef yes, oh, there you go. In the time period of Pentecost, all they could think about was fishing. There's, that's a backslidden condition, huh? It's time to carry the message to the Gentiles, and I'm going to go fishing. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, anyway, I don't want to go down that road. So, this is, this is an uh, easy pattern to see. A period of darkness, a reform message, followed by a mighty manifestation of the Holy Spirit, followed by judgment, disappointment, a work, backslidden condition, repeat of the second angel's message. Is that not easy? Now usually when we take the time and go through this in about five parts, it's not going to happen here. I do not have the energy, willingness, or time. But when you go through it piece by piece, uh, you get to this point. Here's the test question. and we, we, I like saving this for the end of the prophecy school for the test question. We're going to jump right into the test question because our time on this presentation is almost up and see if you can't walk through this. You've had some help. I've already mentioned it earlier in the week. In the time period, and those of you that have been in prophecy schools in Germany or um, Venezuela, if you were at the one in Venezuela, or Malaysia are disqualified from answering this question. Or, or, or any of the brethren from London. So just a limited group that we can, I guess about, I'm shutting down everyone here. But in the days of Moses, there was a period of darkness. What should we expect to see next? A message of reform. And most often, uh, there's a human being that brings it prophet give me a name in the period of Egypt the story of Egypt. Moses Moses brings a message of reform what was his message of reform Sabbath keeping they weren't keeping the Sabbath see I went through this already this week but we'll put it on the tape for the record one more time after the message of reform what should we expect to see in the days of Moses we should Expect to see a revival message that is symbolized by a mighty manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And what would that be? There were seven last plagues in the story of Moses. Ten last plagues. Ten plagues. Okay, ten plagues. And that should lead into what? A judgment. And what would that be? The firstborn. Judgment on the firstborn. And what should follow? And where was the disappointment in that story? At the Red Sea. The Red Sea in front of them, Pharaoh's army behind them. Sister White uses that history to describe the disappointment on October 23rd, 1844, as well as the disappointment of the disciples after the cross. What's next? What was their work? What were they to do? They were, what were they coming out of Egypt for, according to the word of Moses? to worship their God. They were going to build something. What was it? 
the sanctuary. But uh, they were going to get the law first, right? So what happened? The golden calf, right? <laughs> Backslidden condition. And then uh, Moses is up on the mount and receives the law a second time. And when did that take place? Pardon me? What, when? Pentecost. Pentecost. 50 days after. That's why this is called Pentecost. This is called Passover. If you take this pattern right here, this line of prophecy, and you take it off the board, and you bring it right down here to the days of Christ, it lines up perfectly because Christ died on Pentecost. And 50 days later, we have Christ died on the Passover. And 50 days later, we have Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, this is the banner of the third angel's message that if we stand under, we will be able to show the people the things that have been and the things that will be. Because it's in this time period down here in the Millerite movement that the end of the world is illustrated. And it's in this time period that this pattern is established. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the Sabbath that we've just partaken of, and uh, we thank you for being with, it, with us throughout it. We want to understand uh, this history that you pointed us to in order that we might understand the times in which we're living and be able to show from that history the things that will be. Um, we've, we've heard much this week, and we've been blessed, and we want to thank you for it. We want to thank you for the fellowship we've had this week at this school. Um, thank you for stretching our minds on different points of truth. Uh, Lord, let us leave here changed people, uh, carrying a burden to reflect your character and carrying a burden um, to raise this final warning message and empower us with your love, that we have such a love for souls uh, that we can't do anything but at reach out and warn them of the things that are about to take place in this earth. And... Uh, as we draw to the end, I ask that you would help us uh, finish off in this school, make the points we need to make where we dot the I's and cross the T's of any um, question marks that uh, we may have left open and uh, continue to be with us to the very end, not just of this prophecy school, but to the end of this world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>